first time I met Heidi was at a TechYD conference like three or four years ago. Uh, he was speaking on a panel, and uh, I was like blown away by what he was saying. And Dina came and sat next to me. Uh, she said, what's going on? I said, I want to work for that guy. Uh, uh, so, Felix Mitchell. Uh, yeah, so super psyched to be here. And the moral is, make sure you're talking to each other. Make sure you're meeting new people, because you never know uh, the friends you're going to make uh, here. So I said what Christina said. We only have 20 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to dive right in. Uh, Heidi, tell me just really quickly, where did you grow up? What did you study in school? How did you kind of come to Silicon Valley? Sure. Um, so I was born in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Um, party capital of the world. Um, who, my parents are Syrian originally from Damascus, um, moved to the UK when I was a little over a year old, and then my parents moved from the UK to the Bay Area when I was five. And I grew up in the Bay Area primarily, in San Francisco and in the Palo Alto area. In terms of school, I went to Stanford for undergrad. Um, I studied math, econ, and comparative literature, which is basically like an English major, but not in English. And then I went to grad school in the UK at Oxford, um, where I dropped out of a PhD program in economics. Dropping out of PhD is like high likelihood for success in Silicon Valley. Yeah, I think I'm in some elite. There's some elite company that you know, hopefully, um, it rubs off on me. But so far, I'm not quite Larry Page or Sergey Brin or any of these guys. Um, and then did you come back to the Bay Area right away? Or? Uh, that's a good question. So no, actually, I worked in New York. So my first job out of grad school, I worked at Goldman Sachs. I built basically trading models um, for the company was private at the time for the partnership, basically to make those guys who were already um, ridiculously rich even richer, which was a lot of fun. And then um, I started a company right at the peak of the first bubble in the winter of 1999, 2000. Um, that went really great. Um, and so, what, but that what company was it? Um, it was it was interesting. It was a little bit of ahead of, ahead of its time. It was a data sort of structuring and translation engine. So what we would do back then, this was like right when the web was getting started. Um, it was very difficult for people who had like, let's say an Oracle system, like let's say a car parts manufacturer, to talk to somebody who had like an SAP system, let's say a car part or a car maker. And so we were like, you know what, these guys should all talk to each other over the web, and we can just crawl all of their systems and then translate them into like a canonical kind of universal data format, and then transmit that over the internet. So it was a little bit ahead of its time. Um, and when the, when the bubble burst, it was really hard to get customers as a kind of unfunded kind of startup. So um, luckily, we were acquired by Microsoft. So I ended up at Microsoft, and that was a lot of fun. And the product actually still exists today. It's called BizTalk Server. So it's a kind of a cool product that connects different data systems with each other and allows them to talk to each other. And what did you do after Microsoft? Uh, I made a really good career move, um, not going to work at Google. I'm going to work at Yahoo. In 2002, <laughs> yeah, that was a really good career move. And um, yeah, I was at Yahoo for four and a half years. Uh, I ran the search product team, which was also really fun competing against Google. Um, and then the mobile product team, and then the local product team. And so yeah, but I was at Yahoo for a while. Okay, and then tell me, uh, how did you come across Armand Hemawi, and what's AdMob, and how did that whole thing start? Yeah, so I don't know if Sharif al Bedoui is here, but um, Sharif introduced me to Omar. And um, Omar, obviously, is a very successful entrepreneur, but um, AdMob was Omar's fifth startup. Um, and not all of them ended up as well as AdMob did. And so um, early in my career, actually, at Yahoo, I was introduced um, through a mutual friend, actually, who you know, Ali Sheikhli. This is like all the Arab mafia and technology <laughs> in America coming together here. Um, and, and so Omar Hamwi would like come up with an idea, and he'd like ping me and be like, do you think Yahoo would like this? And I'd be like, maybe, I don't know. And so we just kind of created a relationship um, based on a lot of ideas that he was iterating on. And then when he started AdMob in his uh, dorm room at, at Wharton in his first year of his MBA, um, I was actually living in Southern California at the time. Noura and I were living down there after I left Yahoo. And I was having coffee with Sharif, and just randomly, Sharif was like, hey, you know, Omar's doing something really cool. And I was like, oh, yeah, what is it? And he told me about it, and I was like, it does sound really interesting. So we started chatting, and then I was like, dude, you really should raise money and like, turn this into something big and move to the Valley and like, maybe drop out of business school, which was not you know, necessarily something that his parents wanted him to hear. <laughs> but it was a good choice for him, I think, career-wise. Uh, what, what year was this? This was 2006, right. early 2006. Uh, AdMob's kind of a legend in the Bay Area, but like, really quickly, uh, what did AdMob do? Yeah, AdMob was the first sort of iPhone-specific mobile ad network. Um, there were other mobile ad networks that existed before AdMob um, came about. But um, what we did that was really unique was we really sort of focused on the iPhone. And we built the first sort of at scale, very large scale, um, native ad network for iPhones. And what was, what was good about that is that app developers in the app economy were just sort of starting. 
And so people want a distribution in a way to get people to sort of download their apps. And we were really the only kind of game in town that worked really well. You could do it with Google Ads, but they weren't sort of native for the iPhone or native for in-app experiences. And so we really sort of focused all of our effort on that. And we obviously kind of rode the iPhone wave and did really well as a result. And uh, so after, when you joined, yeah. uh, sort of what happened to the company? How big did you guys get? What was revenue looking like? Yeah, so um, we were about 30 people when I joined. And then we grew to almost 200 people by the time uh, we were acquired by Google in 2010. Uh, revenue when I joined was in the sort of low tens of millions, and when I left was in the hundreds of millions in terms of run rate. And um, the organization sort of evolved in a lot of different ways. When I first got there, um, the company was actually still focused on non-iPhone ads. And um, I remember one of my very first board meetings, um, I pitched to our board of directors that we basically focus no more engineering or product development effort on non-iPhone product development, and I literally got laughed out of the room. Like, the guys were like, well, what, pro what proportion of your revenue is iPhone, or our revenue is iPhone? And I was like, less than 1%. And they were like, oh, so you want to focus all of our product development effort on less than 1% of the revenue? I was like, I will bet my job that it'll be more than 50% of our revenue within 12 months. And literally within, like, six months, it was actually more than 50% of our revenue. So... And how, how did you, is it just that you saw the iPhone and you were like, this is it? No, no. So it was a data-driven decision. So I would, as part of my job, I ran product and I ran business operations. I would sort of go into our logs and just look at, like, the statistics and try to figure out what was doing well and what was, wasn't doing well. And I found this really interesting, you know, graphical user ID or GUID um, that belonged to the iPhone. And I was like, holy crap, this thing is growing, like, vertically. Like, it's like a straight line growth. And so I just extrapolated, like, even with some decay, if that thing continued to grow the way that it grew, what it would be, and that's how I sort of made my case. It wasn't like, yeah, I think the iPhone is going to be really big, guys. We should, we should bet the farm on the iPhone, and you can fire me if it doesn't work. No, it wasn't like that. And so 2010 uh, comes around, yeah. and you're in the hundreds of millions, you're 200 people, um, and how did kind of Google come to the door? Um, well, Omar met Steve Jobs, and I think that kind of started the whole thing, the whole cascade. So Steve literally harassed Omar for like three months to buy the company, and he used all sorts of people who are from Syria will understand this, all sorts of Saudi negotiation tactics, including <laughs> calling him 10 times an hour and telling him like this was a brotherly thing that we should do. That part I'm kidding about. <laughs> um, and, and Google got wind of it, and Google was like, no way. And Google just came in and offered us something that was far higher than, again, being Syrian, Steve Jobs is also very stingy. So, <laughs> so Google offered us something much sort of better than, than Apple did, and that's kind of how it happened. Did you guys, when you deliberated about the acquisition, did you guys like have a number in mind, or was there any like doubt whether we should do it or not? Like... So remember, this was 2010. And 2008, if you guys remember, um, was not a pretty year um, in any industry. And, you know, we, even, even AdMob, which was growing like a weed, experienced some pretty serious slowdown in our growth. And so, you know, at the time, it was like a bit of an existential question. Like, can we survive with these giants, you know, Apple on one side and Google on the other, potentially coming after us? And I think that while in retrospect, it's, it's fine to say that we sold too early and the company would be worth tens of billions of dollars now, Back then, that was absolutely anything but like a foregone conclusion. So we decided that it's probably safer to be part of one of these sort of constellations or galaxies, if you will. And Google just felt more sort of right for us. I mean, obviously, what they offered us was significantly more. But even as a product line, it felt like it fit much more into Google's product line, being an ad sort of based company than in you know, Apple's product line, which is much more of a device and kind of software based company. So. How much did you guys uh, end up selling for? We ended up, so the, the actual sort of numbers on the paper were $750 million, but because we took stock, it ended up actually being effectively more than a billion dollar acquisition at the time. In 2010, I feel like. In 2010. Incredible. Yeah, it was pretty crazy at the time. And, and the thing that was really unheard of um, that I think got us a lot of notoriety was that what's known as the sort of buyout clause, um, sort of basically if, if the deal fell apart, because it had to go through federal antitrust review, if the deal fell apart, Google was actually on the hook to pay us the full amount, $750 million just in cash if it didn't work. So that was like unheard of at the time. So that was kind of like the insurance policy um, in case the thing didn't go through. One hell of a product. Uh, yeah, still a huge product. 
And so I know some some of you, some of the folks from AdMob uh, end up going to Google. Yeah. Uh, what did you do and why? Yeah, I left like very shortly after the acquisition, um, and basically took time off and spent time with my family and kids and stuff. Um, I had two young kids at the time, still do. Um, and then I started to tinker with a whole bunch of different ideas that I had, and one was like a private photo sharing app that didn't really go anywhere, and another was, you know, kind of going back to my old days, a sort of very automated but like, you know, statistically driven hedge fund idea that I had, which also didn't really go very far. Um, and then I got sick, and that's kind of how the idea for collective health came about. Uh, I think it's actually an interesting story, uh, sort of what happened. Uh, we don't need all the details of your sickness, but uh, generally what happened? Yeah, so it was, it was two days before my eldest daughter's sixth birthday. It was uh, March 13th, 2013, and I was sitting at my desk, um, actually at home that afternoon at my desk, and I just got this really intense pain in the middle of my stomach. And I was like, God, that feels really weird. And it was like a cramp, but unlike any cramp that I'd ever felt in my life. So I was like, hmm, I wonder what that is. And then like, it got worse and worse and worse. Um, and eventually like, it got so bad that I was like, okay, I think something's really wrong with me. So I went upstairs, because um, I was in the basement in my man cave. And um, my wife was in the kitchen. She's like, you okay? And I was like, no, I don't feel good. I like, have a really bad pain in my stomach. She's like, what, like, what kind of bad? I was like, like, really bad. And she was like, oh, okay, um, well, let's go to the doctor. Then I was like, okay, I'm gonna call my brother first and just, my brother's a surgeon, and just see what he, you know, what he thinks before I go like, through the hassle of spending hours in the Stanford emergency room. So I call my brother and, and typical, well, my, this is my brother, but also typical kind of surgeon fashion. My brother was like, you probably just have bad gas. <laughs> and I was like, you know, this is like one serious burrito that I must have eaten if, if this is the gas that I'm having. He's like, but to be safe, you should get in the car and go to the emergency room and just get checked out. So by the time, so I'm luckily, this is like very lucky. Luckily, my wife was home and she was able to drive me or else I don't think I would have been able to drive. I would have had to call an ambulance and pay for all that. So we got to the emergency room and the pain was so bad at the time that I like couldn't sit still. And so they were trying to like put an IV in me and like they stuck me with a needle and blood started going everywhere because they couldn't actually put the line in. And then so they like jabbed me in the arm and kind of knocked me out. And then I kind of was dazed for a little while and then I woke up, you know, a few hours later being told that I was like going to have most of my intestine removed. And I was like, okay. And I was just like delirious at this time. Um, and then uh, I woke up like, I guess almost like a day later and I'd had most of my uh, small intestine removed and I had what's known uh, actually in Arabic as Ardit Nasran. So basically my small intestine twisted on itself just randomly and uh, I ended up losing most of my small intestinal tissue as a result. So I had kind of like a heart attack in my small intestine. Um, and then I had a pretty grueling you know, few days in the ICU and then in the hospital and like month, weeks and months of recovery, um, trying to get better from that. And it was a pretty close call. I mean, like my, I found out later that a relative of mine had actually died from this in Syria um, because they didn't really know how to treat stuff like this in like the 50s and 60s. Um, and so it was one of those things where you're like, holy crap, I just like kind of skirted, skirted death. Um, and you know, in this sort of process of recovering, I obviously started to get all sorts of bills from my insurance company, or what looked like bills, from my insurance company and then bills from the hospital. And I was like, oh my God, this is like a really, this is like an awful kind of part two to this episode. Um, and then part of that, part of those sort of mailings that I got were denials. So my insurance company saying that they wouldn't cover you know, a bunch of my hospital bills and, and surgical bills. And so that's kind of what got me thinking about the health insurance industry and collective health. Did you get one of those, uh, you know, things that look like a bill, but then a big yeah. bold letter says, this is not a bill, yeah, and you nice, don't know what to do with it? Like, totally. You know, you yeah, I got a lot of it. I got a lot of those. Yeah. I got actually, I got 12 of those for just one surgery, which was really nice. It was like, I got one for the surgeon's time. I got one for the other surgeon's time. I got one for the anesthesiologist's time. I got one for the medication that they gave me before surgery. I got one for the medication they gave me during surgery. I got one for the medication they gave me in the post-operative recovery room. I mean, it was just like, do I really need to be getting like a receipt? Like, if, imagine if you went to like a restaurant and instead of getting like a credit card statement every month, you get like an individual receipt mailed to you from each restaurant. You'd be like, why am I getting these receipts? So yeah, I got a lot of those. Uh, it was so, awesome. you went, so, so you said, wow, this is like really messed up. And then yeah. what was kind of the next step after that? Yeah, the denial. So I got one, I got one EOB that said $66,000 worth of sort of build cost was not covered by, by my insurer. And I was like, holy shit, okay. Excuse my language. And um, I was like, wow, okay. So I got on the phone and I tried to understand why they wouldn't cover it. And they said, so I had a very unusual kind of 
obviously thing happening, but also an unusual surgical procedure done to me. Typically, when this kind of thing happens, they basically do one surgery. They cut out all the dead tissue, they connect you back together again, and then they kind of you know, send you on your way, so to speak. But I had so much tissue loss that they were worried that I'd have to have a bag outside of my body. It's known as a colostomy bag to collect basically all of the stuff that comes out of you. Um, and for a guy my age, it was kind of like a crappy thing. So the surgeon, who's really, really good, thought that he could do the procedure in sort of two steps and not cut out all the dead tissue, but cut out most of it, and then see if the part kind of on the edges revascularized um, through just basically irrigation, just keeping me kind of open and irrigating the wound, if you will. Um, so I was open in the ICU for almost a full 24 hours before they put me back together again. And so that, that led to an abdominal infection and led to like probably a longer than average hospital stay, which kind of, for most insurance companies, they just kind of operate on very simple, brittle rules. They were just like, okay, we're gonna deny this because it doesn't look like anything else we've seen before, so. Wow. And so I try to talk to people on the phone, like explaining like why they did this, and they're like, well, get your doctor on the phone. I was like, okay, I'll get my doctor on the phone, and it didn't get anywhere. Wow. It's fun. Just what you need after surgery, right? It's awesome, yeah, yeah. it's really fun. Uh, and so then, uh, uh, is that when you kind of talked to Rajai yeah. about collective health, or what was kind of the next step? Yeah, so Rajai was actually one of the first people I, I called, because I know so one of my co-founders and one of my very closest friends, um, Rajai Bhaknishi, is an MD-PhD, and his PhD was in health policy, and so I called him and I was like, hey dude, I just had this happen, and I'm getting all these denials, like what do I do, is this normal? And he was like, he's like, honestly, like try to fight it if you can, and if you can't, talk to the hospital, I'll help you talk to the hospital, try to negotiate something, um, he's like, but honestly, this is normal. I see it all the time. I have to deal with this kind of crap every day as even a doctor, because people will come in and not know what they're gonna get sort of into and then get a bill that they didn't expect and then like all sorts of stuff starts to happen. So it's interesting about the healthcare system, at least in this country, unlike the blood, is that you actually don't know what your actual bill is until they actually see you and you get treated. Whereas, you know, if in Syria you go to get like your whatever, your gallbladder removed, they tell you it's whatever, or whatever, and then you're kind of on your way and it's done. Here it's like, you know, you have to submit all the claims and then you don't know sort of what's going to be billed and what's going to be approved and what your employer covers and blah, blah, blah. So it's like one of the last places in this economy where you actually don't know what you're paying for until you've, so to speak, bought it, which kind of is crappy. So people can't budget. And that's one of the reasons why I think healthcare or unforeseen healthcare costs are the number one cause of bankruptcy in this country. And I think had we not had you know, the fortune of having sold a company and had some cash around, it would have been pretty dicey trying to pay for all those bills. So what was the first step you guys took in sort of uh, starting Collective Health? And maybe talk a little bit about sort of how did you come up with the idea? Or how, what's Collective Health specifically do and uh, yeah. why you guys chose to go down that path? Uh, so Collective Health is a health insurance company. It's a startup health insurance company. Um, what we do specifically is we enable companies to be behave like health insurance companies themselves without the need to have to buy health insurance from an actual health insurance company, if that makes sense. And so think about it like instead of paying somebody to cover your health care costs, you just pay for your health care costs yourself. And that's how most large companies in this country actually pay for their health care. They actually don't buy health insurance from another company. They pay for their employees or most of their employees' healthcare costs themselves. And we got, we got into it actually not sort of haphazardly. We, we first were like, okay, this really sucks. I mean, Roger eventually got religion about it through a series of discussions and you know, he was just pissed off. I think that one of his best friends had, had a, a, a sort of thing like this happen to him. And so he's like, okay, dude, I'm done with writing papers about how the system needs to get fixed. I wanna do something to fix it. So let's start a company. It was actually his idea. He's like, let's start a company. And I was like, really? He was like, yeah, let's start a company. I was like, okay, let's do it. And um, we just started to read. And that was like, I think probably one of the most important lessons in this um, startup for me was the importance of just doing kind of like your reading and doing research before you dive into something. Because um, I think a lot of people are excited and like, you know, want to do something and want to dive right in. But I think sometimes, especially upfront, slow is fast, so to speak, and fast can sometimes slow you down. So we read everything we could get our hands on. We read the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, you know, the ACA. We read pretty much every major book or textbook on the health insurance industry and on sort of health insurance reform and health care reform. We met with like every expert that we knew, including a bunch of Stanford classmates who were friends of mine and friends of Rajais and professors and stuff like that. And we just started to sort of formulate a map and a picture of what the healthcare system in the US looked like. Because you know, it's pretty complicated, it's very broad, it's very vast, and you can easily kind of find yourself in a rabbit hole that doesn't have an end. 
so to speak, um, if you don't understand kind of how everything fits together. So we spent probably just three months, I'd say most of the summer of 2013, just reading, talking to people, meeting with experts, and trying to understand how the whole sort of jigsaw puzzle fit together. And during the course of that research, we discovered a couple of things that were really eye-opening to us. The first is, um, and insurance companies love to blame doctors and hospitals for why the cost of healthcare in this country is increasing so fast, but the reality is it's not. So actually, when you look at the data, and we looked at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services data from 1999 to 2013, we discovered a really interesting trend, which is if you look at the underlying cost of care, i.e. what doctors and hospitals sort of take home, so to speak, it grew like just a little bit higher than the consumer price index or the sort of cost of inflation. Um, but when you look at the trend in health insurance premium premiums, whether it's individual or sort of corporate or employer's premiums, they were growing by about three times as fast per year over that period of time. And at the same time, the amount that deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums and basically the amount that you have to pay as an individu individual that your insurance company doesn't cover grew by about 120, 130% over that same period. And we were like, huh, this is really weird. Like, doctors don't seem to, and, I, and I'd heard this coming from a family of doctors, like I look at my brother, he's not like living the lar like, large life, you know, and his salary is not increasing, um, it's actually going down in real terms. And I was like, okay, this corroborates what at least I've heard anecdotally from physicians, that their pay is not increasing. Um, but you sort of open any financial report or quarterly report of a big health insurance company and you see a very sort of clear trend that these guys are becoming more and more and more profitable every year. So that was the first thing that we discovered that was really interesting. And the second thing we discovered was that the vast majority of employers in this country who pay for most of people's healthcare expenses, if you guys work here, you know that, um, were self-insured. They weren't actually paying for health insurance from a health insurance company. And we were like, okay, that makes sense. So these guys are basically self-selecting out of this trend because they can. They're big enough, basically, to be able to blend the risk across all of their employees and avoid having to buy health insurance from a big health insurance company. And so we were like, okay, two things. We need to fix the health insurer problem because it's clearly, there's clearly something wrong there because the trend is not sort of in line with healthcare cost trends. And we need to do something that services employers because employers are clearly signaling that A, they're willing to do something new, and B, they are paying the vast majority of healthcare costs in this country, at least for people who are employed. And so that's how we kind of we coalesced around the idea of collective health, which is enabling companies, even down to relatively small group sizes, to self-insure their health insurance plans and to do it in a much better way than a traditional health insurance company does. Health insurance companies are notorious for not wanting to share data. They're obviously notorious for bad customer sort of care and customer experience or user experience. So we wanted to fix all of that, but we needed a sort of an economic angle that made sense. And so that's how we started. What, what's been, the, so, so now Collective Health is two years old. What's, uh, last question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's been like the biggest challenge you'd say? Um, obviously, as you've mentioned, insurance is like uh, a very regulated industry. It's very personal, it's costly. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges you've faced? Uh... I'd say for me personally, I had, like two challenges are really, really big for me. Number one, I think as an entrepreneur, especially one that comes out of the tech sector and consumer tech and ad tech specifically, like I want to just like break stuff and I want to like really radically change how things are done. And there are just some practical constraints and realities to how the healthcare system works that doesn't make that kind of it's called aggressive or an aggressive posture kind of possible. You have to be very measured in how you do things because you're dealing with a very large, a very sort of stolid, established system and you're dealing with people's health care. So you can't just kind of, you know, like if, for example, if Facebook doesn't, you know, post one of your posts by accident, it's not like the world is going to end. But if, you know, for, for example, you don't pay for somebody's maternity or delivery or care, that's a big deal. So you can't sort of screw things up. So the desire to be really aggressive, you kind of have to temper with the practical realities of the market that you're operating in. And then for me, I think, you know, this is my first kind of big startup in the sense like growing as quickly as it is um, after AdMob, but being in the sort of real driver's seat versus being one of like, you know, six people who reported to the CEO. Um, I've had to really grow in a lot of ways that I didn't expect I'd have to. And that's also been a real challenge for me. Like sometimes I just kind of want to be like, we're going this direction and that's it. But you can't really do that. Like especially with smart people who want to feel like they have a seat at the table, you have to listen and build consensus. And you know, as a true Arab male, I'm not good at that. So <laughs> I, um, I, uh, I can't believe I just said that, but yeah. 
Um, well, I could talk to you all day, Heidi, but uh, Sarah's not going to let that happen. So, uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Dave. Um,